Hi everybody, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It is, what is it, May 18th today, Friday. And um, today we're going to take a look at a few uh, transits uh, relevant for today and um, this weekend. And also we're going to take a look at a sort of longer lasting transit, uh, which is the uh, trine from uh, Jupiter to Neptune. So these are both two big transits that are happening um, in the day's weeks to come. Uh, it's going to be actually uh, Jupiter trying Neptune is in effect for quite a while. So uh, we have a lot to um, lots to talk about with that one. But let's talk first about the astrology of the weekend and kind of what to expect uh, between now and Sunday. Um, first of all, uh, today's astrology that we'll be looking at features uh, the moon just coming off from an opposition to Saturn. So uh, that's just separating right now. Um, we're also uh, moving into a grand water trine this afternoon and evening as the uh, moon is going to move into a trine with Neptune and a trine with Jupiter. Jupiter and Neptune themselves are perfecting in a trine. Uh, so what is a grand water trine? What are all of these things in astrology, in fact? Grand trines, kites, Solomon's key, yods, all of this stuff. Um, so there's there's maybe a little bit of a, of a sidetrack we can take just asking about these grand aspect configurations. Do they mean anything? Are they real? Are they just hype? What should we think about them? So uh, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, then uh, tomorrow we're getting into uh, the moon opposed to Pluto. Uh, we're just coming off from Mars's square to Uranus. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about that as well. And that should give us enough to think about for the weekend. Um, we might actually, we might talk a little bit about Venus changing signs and entering Cancer as well. So that'll give us enough to talk about the, for the weekend. And then we're going to look at this um, uh, Jupiter trine Neptune dynamic, which is um, very powerful and uh, underrated transit. You know, it's, it's one of those ones that can sneak by um, and we don't pay it enough attention, especially in the midst of Uranus changing signs or whatever. But you have two slower moving planets, an outer planet and then Jupiter, which is uh, slowish compared to, say, you know, Venus, Mercury, Mars. Um, so it, it, the trine between these two planets is very important. So we're going to look at that as well. So that's our agenda. Let's dive in. Um, if you have any questions as we go, feel free to put them in the chat box. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see some familiar faces there. Um, so first of all, uh, let's just talk briefly about what we're getting into today. Uh, the moon's coming off in opposition to Saturn. It's across the Cancer Capricorn axis. And so you have um, both of these planets in their home signs, their, their own domiciles, which means they're facing off in the kind of quintessential opposition that's inherently implied between these two signs. This is the sign of the moon and the sign of Saturn, and the moon and Saturn in their home signs are opposing one another. They don't get along super well, moon and Saturn in, um, in, in general. The, the Thema Mundi, the chart of the world that ancient astrologers um, uh, used, and it was, a, it was a kind of teaching tool, um, the, the original placement of the planets in their domiciles tell us about how the planets regard one another. And um, the moon is a planet of gestation and life. It's been raining for like several days here, right? It's just been, it's, it looks like a small, I was taking a walk to the mailbox yesterday with my uh, daughter and um, she had her little rain boots on and we were walking through the yard and she was just amazed by how tall the grass was and how green and kind of humid and everything. And I said, oh, it's like a jungle out here. And she just looked around and I was like thinking in my head, I was like, gosh, this is so uh, Jupiter-Neptune coming together. And then I remembered, oh, the moon's going to go into Cancer here and we're going to have uh, actually a, a, a grand water trine forming. And I was like, wow, I remember, you know, uh, being in the actual Amazon rainforest when I, I took a lot, a long period of time in my life to uh, study shamanism from South America. And I remember actually being in the Amazon and uh, how wet it was and, and how much life was growing everywhere and, uh, and how overwhelming that was but, and, and beautiful. We're going to sort of talk about that with the Grand Water Trine, but 
Um, before we get to the, the grand water trine, you have, I mean, just that, that represents the moon really well. Just that sense of the moisture, the coolness, the, uh, or maybe the, the heat, but the, the moon um, is a constantly changing orb in the sky whose uh, face is currently waxing. And so you have the, the, the slow building and gestation of something right now, and you can feel it. So the moon, every cycle, the moon is growing something. The moon is indicating the ongoing changes happening in our lives. In fact, nothing in the material world that we deal with is, is stable, right? Even, even the most stable appearing things like mountains, right? Or uh, the pole star, you know, some, something in the sky that looks like just absolutely unmovable. Well, all these things are changing. Their states are never completely steady. They're always uh, demonstrating some level of fluctuation. Well, the moon is like the quintessential planet of that change and transformation, but it gets right down to the, to the kind of, for us in cancer, it's like the warm bloodedness of it. You know, it's like uh, we're vulnerable creatures. We're moody creatures. We sense the change in environments. We sense the, the feelings of shifting things in our bodies. And it's a sensitive place to be planet earth. Um, I mean, I, I was contemplating this yesterday. I, before we went to the mailbox, I took my daughter to the aquarium. Another very uh, Cancerian thing to do. I'm a Cancer son, so we were at the aquarium and and we were looking at all of the fish and you know and their movements in these places and um, they're so, so fish are so sensitive, you know, so sensitive, um, but also in some ways um, so docile and so uh, almost unconscious looking, you know. So it's a it's a funny paradox. You go up to a fish tank and they can look just like you know, fish, fish kind of, kind of look like they're in a stupor, just kind of hanging out doing nothing. But if you move even your finger near the fish tank, dart, dart, sudden, sudden movements and darting. And we're like that as people, we, every day in our lives, we experience uh, the sensitivity of being alive and also the, the proneness uh, to falling asleep. Uh, we, we want to be in our mother's wombs in a sense where everything is very sensitive and very cozy all at once. Um, and in some ways, that's the best place to be. Really, in a sense, our spiritual life, we're looking for that kind of homeostasis in the arms of the divine, right? We want that kind of eternal, everlasting connection. Um, like, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a almost parental relationship with, uh, with God or something. We, you know, and that, and that feeling of needing that cozy um, uh, feeling of interconnection with something bigger than ourselves uh, you know, the cancer moon just makes that really pronounced. Um, and on the other hand, and that's good. And on the other hand, um, in the material world, that often translates into what we call uh, codependency. And that's just a, you know, a, not a clinical term here, but just a, a general term that can point toward the, the need that we all have to basically um, feel as though our life is on autopilot, that we're, we're, smoothly cruising down the river of life. Everything's good. We have everything in place that we need, that we want, that we desire. Starbucks is everywhere. Just a, a, you're just a few steps away from a warm injection of happiness. You know, that kind of, we live with that. America, the United States, cancer sun, you know, a place of privacy and comfort. You know, <laughs> we all have our little homes. We all, so that's the world of cancer. Now the moon when it hits the opposition to Saturn, which is in Capricorn, is hitting a, just a fundamentally different energy, right? So you have, uh, you know, the Capricornian energy is uh, more about the, the cold, hard reality of it all. You know, that's not, that's not easy. Um, there's a story that I read when uh, Saturn was moving into Capricorn from a, a section of a famous Purana called the Bhagavat Purana. And sometimes um, this one section of it called the Uddhava Gita is quoted and read from almost separately, and it's considered to be something like an addendum to the Bhagavad Gita, uh, where Krishna is speaking to Arjuna. And in this text, um, Krishna is um, kind of, well, there's a story that's unfolding, we'll just put it that way. And um, in the story, there's uh, a family of birds, and um, it's the most loving, stable, safe family, you know, kind of scene. And uh, take that as the Cancerian um, you know, the Cancerian example of homeostasis, safety. Uh, and um, there are, uh, one day, the, the mother and the um, baby bird get caught in the net of a hunter. 
and um, it's you know it, it's this devastating event for the father who's uh, who who is watching, and he realizes there's absolutely nothing he can do. He's completely powerless in the situation, um, but of course he is um, so completely attached uh, to his his family, understandably, uh, that um, he swoops down and just you know. Th- throws himself into the net basically and gets caught up with them. And there's part of us that maybe like sentimentally would be like, you know, or, or we, we would think of that as heroic. We would think, well, that, because that's the Cancerian ideal. That's, you know, in, in a sense, it's like, well, you know, you, you go down with the, with the, with the ship of family, you go down um, emotionally, you go down with your attachments and, and that's what we think of as noble. But in that story, um, uh, there's the moral of the story is of course uh, a little more yogic and it's more about the letting go in a moment where there's nothing more to do but to let go and um, so it feels rather stern when you see this 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 teaching that's actually like well um, this was actually rather ignorant of the of the father bird to dive down into this net and just sacrifice himself for no reason when basically he could go on um, and uh, continue doing things that might be valuable in the world or valuable for his own existence, even though um, it, it might seem really noble. The yogic teaching in that text is uh, super Saturnine, right? That, that To us, that feels really Capricorn. It's very, put away the sentimentality, uh, face the cold, hard facts. We're all going to have to say goodbye to one another someday. Anything that you think is giving you homeostasis now in in the material world is only temporary it can only give you shelter for so long and then it'll it'll go away and you'll be abandoned you'll be left in the cold you'll be out in the dark you'll be you'll be suffering again uh ex- especially to the extent that you became deluded by the idea that it would last forever oh my gosh ouch my cancerian ears you know what i mean like that saturn you know and that that's that that hard cold but very earthy reality and if you don't believe me, um, just watch, you know, watch a little planet Earth on the Discovery Channel. The reality of nature is that, um, you know, the, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult place out there. And it looks good when it's set to music and you have that lovely voice of David Attenborough uh, narrating, right? It makes you feel like you're in a nice set of pajamas in the inside of like an old British uh, library, you know, and Mary Poppins is hanging out somewhere nearby. And it's, it's, you know, it's lovely to watch like the life of penguins or something, <laughs> you know, but then there's this reality, which is that, you know, the, the ducks are going to, the little ducklings, one's going to get snatched up by a fox. And that's just the like, oh my God, that's, so that's like the sort of Saturn, Saturnine reality of it. So moon and Saturn facing off in an opposition, um, that's what you're waking up to this morning. You're waking up to those two dynamics, just looking at each other and being like, hmm, and so, and you can feel that in a lot of different ways. You can feel that in terms of feeling a little heavy or depressed or feeling longing or feeling like you want to cuddle up, but you got to get to work or you feel like, I don't want to do this. I, I'd, I need to take care of myself, but oh, I should really do the responsible thing or there's issues within the family. Um, you know, you can, you can just imagine those two qualities in the different ways that they might be at one another. They both have something interesting to say on an archetypal level. Um, so, there's also plenty of yogic teachings about um, showing compassion and uh, setting aside the rule of the law or the letter of the law. Sometimes the letter of the law needs to be set aside in order to demonstrate a higher degree of compassion or sensitivity for sentient beings. So at any rate, you get the point. Now, I set that up specifically because that gives us some really good background from which to understand the movement that's happening today into the Grand Water Trine. The grand water trine that's coming through is uh, from the moon in Cancer to uh, Neptune in Pisces to Jupiter in Scorpio. First of all, let's just start off with the fact that that's a whole lot of water. And what is water associated with? Growth. When Where there is water, there's life. And so uh, life in the material world is um, in its most, you could say, in its most um, uh, embodied sense, filled with water. And uh, where you know our bodies, however, so much water in our bodies and so forth. Um, and so let's just first let's start with saying that over this weekend you've got just a proliferation of water. 
Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we respond to that? Well, um, you know, sometimes people are really quick to jump to uh, water is emotion, and it certainly is connected to our emotions. But well, let's break down what it is to emote, right? What e- e- what does the word emote mean? Well, um, the word emote uh, has the uh, sense of something that both comes in to us and then is responded to, and it's the response. The emoting is is a way of saying it's about the way in which one uh, responds, but it's not the literalness of the response. It's more of the tone, quality, mood, or feeling of what comes in and the tone, quality, mood, or feeling of what goes out as a response to what's coming in. And when that dynamic, that, that cycling becomes more amplified, then we say, oh, it's a moody feeling or it's a moody environment right now in the stars or something like that. But again, what does that mean? It just means that the volume is turned up on your ability to feel, sense, uh, understand um, the subtle um, feelings, moods, auras of the information coming into you, of what people say and what's behind the words, of the weather and how it affects you, of the noises or sounds in the environment that you fill your ears with, of the things that you put into your mouth and into your body, of the things that you say to other people without thinking. All of this creates moods and um, uh, movements of subtle feelings. And uh, when those things, uh, the volume gets turned up on them, Then also the volume gets turned up on how we respond to those things. So it creates this kind of uh, undulating web of subtle moods and feelings that are being uh, emoted, right? So when we say emotion, we have to know a little bit more about what we're talking about first, because emotion, sometimes the way we hear the word emotion, ironically, is not, um, there's it's almost like a a technicality that comes into the word in astrology. It's like sometimes in astrology in general, there's a sort of general problem with nominalism in the language, which means that we all memorize a sort of technical set of terms without uh, really taking our heart into the words to feel and, and get into the substance of what's being said when we say, well, the moon is in this sign or that sign and it's watery. So it's really emotional right now of the catchphrases like that that actually lack all substantive mood, feeling, and subtlety, then we stand to actually have zero relationship with those things. So at any rate, um, the, uh, we'll just say that the, the volume is turned up on the subtle interplay of mood and feeling in the air right now. And when we're saying it's emotional, we're saying that you have to be very careful of the tendency to take in those subtle feelings and moods in a way that is uh, very strong and sometimes uh, distorted or not not uh, clear. We'll talk more about why in a second. Um, and to express or exude feelings, moods, um, subtle things, subtle information um, that is not accurate or that's distorted in some way. That's one of the main things you have to be careful for in a grand water trine. Um, why you know, so why? Well, um, one of the the main things is that uh, the, for example, the moon in, in ancient astrology, uh, especially in the East, is associated with the mind. And so sometimes we think of, you, you, you know, you'll say to someone, well, if you're a very, um, if you're a very intelligent person, then you have your emotions under control. Like to be spiritually advanced, sometimes we even think that you have to have uh, greater intelligence than your then you are, you have to be more intelligent than you are emotional, basically. And sometimes that's true, right? Sometimes our, our, you know, our emotions go all over the place and they, they get out of control and, and everything like that. Um, but we we're in the habit of separating our um, intelligence from our, uh, our feelings, right? And, and the, but in fact, in ancient astrology, again, the moon was related to the mind. And so there is, really very little separation in ancient cosmology between uh, feelings and thoughts. Um, and uh, in other words, there's, 
the the mind in a sense is um uh more material than we think it is it has m more material layers to it than we than we think it does the mind is not just like information and thoughts the mind is actually an entire network that processes information on all sorts of different levels some of them are watery some are earthy some are fiery some are airy so sometimes we mistakenly categorize say the air signs as mind and the water signs as feeling and those kinds of distinctions are actually not in line with what ancient mystics thought about the mind in general so the mind is much more comprehensive than that and it actually expresses itself through all four elements but when we're talking about water in particular what we're talking about is we're talking about the most fluid and receptive of the changes happening in the material world and how we cognize them, communicate them, sense them, make, make sense out of them, in other words, and then uh, communicate or emote and uh, uh, re respond to them. So those, those constant fluctuations and changes in the material world, as a, a, we are physical beings sensing and feeling them, um, the level at which we sense and feel changes and fluctuations in the field around us always and the way that we respond to it very naturally and instinctually that's water so why do we say be careful that the grand water trine doesn't distort things because you're talking about something first of all anytime you call something grand in astrology and there's a few too many grands in my humble <laughs> my humble opinion there are a few too many things named grand in astrology but um Anytime, anytime you get uh, a grand water trine, you're talking about the potential to, uh, for the, the state of feeling and sensing those material changes happening all around you to be greatly amplified. So that as you feel them coming in, you also have the tendency to respond to them in a way that is greatly amplified. That can be really helpful in the sense of being imaginative, being poetic, um, sensing or feeling things, you know, with a almost, almost like having a sixth sense. Uh, the ability to um, pick up on messages and subtleties, nuances and innuendo, um, to have an almost, uh, uh, almost like a, a prophetic sense of the way that something is going to unfold or happen prior to the way that it does. No, um, no psychic abilities needed or something like that. It's not like you have to be a psychic to experience some level of heightened, um, uh, um, almost uh, heightened psychic ability under, a, I hate even using that word, you know, but, but that's, the, um, that's the idea. But you also have to be careful, again, because with a grand water trine, the propensity uh, to blow things out of proportion and to, um, to, Although you may accurately be sensing data in the environment, feeling it on a, on a deep, almost unspeakable, intuitive level, you can feel the changes, uh, that doesn't mean that they are going to play out in the way that you think they, they are. For example, let's say that you're sitting down one night and you're watching TV and uh, you're watching it with your partner and your partner sees an attractive person on the television. You're, say, you're watching a movie and uh, maybe they're not, uh, they're uh, scantily clad. And they're, they're watching something like that, and they, you can kind of see them getting a little, you can feel them getting a little uh, turned on by it. It, it. Okay, the grand water trine, an example of what could happen could be that you accurately perceiving that could take that as an indication that they must be cheating on you. They must be having an affair, right? So you can, you can blow it out of total proportion. So uh, that's, I mean, just... Just something like that. So, um, someone mentioned uh, there is also emotional intelligence, right? That's exactly what we're speaking of when we say that all elements can express themselves in terms of the mind. Uh, the water is, uh, um, is when we talk about emotional intelligence, we're talking about what, what, we're, what we're speaking of right now with the way that we sense and feel information and respond to it in um, sort of the language of moods and um, feeling, feeling things in a physical sense. It's not just I'm crying or I'm sad or I'm glad or I'm happy or it's not just an emotion that I have. It's a, it's a dynamic, ongoing, fluid process of relating to the environment in a, in a subtle and responsive manner. So uh, at any rate, 
again, so you want to be careful of things kind of getting blown out of proportion. Um, at the same time, the, um, the, the Neptune, um, Jupiter trine in particular, uh, is offers some really amazing themes of its own that the moon is amplifying today as well. So what I want to do next, after just talking a little bit about the emotional uh, difference between sort of, you know, emotion and uh, feeling and mood and and what these things really mean, um, I want to now move into uh, talking just a little bit about uh, Jupiter and Neptune. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, all right, so Jupiter is preparing to trine Neptune. Um, that's going to be happening, really, because I, you know, I count it not just when it's exact, but the influence is already there. It's a degree away, um, but the influence will be uh, the or the aspect will um, perfect itself. Let's see, uh, right about May twenty fourth or twenty fifth. But the influence is there within you know three degrees, uh, all the way through the end of June. Um, and uh, really, it's it's there all the way through July. It's within three degrees, and then it's there all the way through August and perfecting again late August, and then uh, it's within three degrees all the way to like mid September. So you can count on this influence that I'm about to talk about being here between now and the middle of September, which is why it's another important one to look at. Um, all right, so. Here are some things that happened under the last Jupiter-Neptune trine, which happened in December of 2017. This is Jupiter and Scorpio trine Neptune uh, in Pisces. Now here you have, let's start by saying you have the themes of expansion, wisdom, growth, uh, all Jupiterian themes, faith, um, uh, abundance, uh, bigness, um, and then Neptune, imagination, mysticism, deception, illusion, uh, intoxication, um, uh, the uh, non-ordinary, the um, that which is transcendental. So you have those kinds of archetypal themes coming together. Well, the last time that those two got together in this trine, which has been working since Jupiter entered Scorpio um, in uh, November, in December, Nature Magazine published an article recognizing the first known interstellar object. This was called Uma Uma. I'm going to say that incorrectly, but it was um, very interesting, and um, it was happening sort of in step with the Me Too movement, and it was also a phallic-looking object. I don't know if you guys remember this. But so you have the themes of the archetypal and the interstellar coming together to speak or say something, to expand our imagination about the cosmos. And that's kind of a mundane news event that was very Jupiter-Neptune. Now, on November 22nd, the International Court of Justice found Ratko Melodic guilty of genocide committed during the Bosnian War, which was the worst massacre in Europe since World War II. Um, and the reason this is a significant one is because uh, Jupiter-Neptune have a lot to do with um, religious themes. Um, uh, the uh, desire for uh, a religion to uh, rule over all, for re religious power, the inflation or grandness of religious authority or religious themes. Also with Jupiter and a Mars ruled sign, violence, and uh, Neptune related to cleansing and cleaning and washing. You also have the uh, themes of um, genocide and, and, and ethnic cleansing related to re religious stances and things like that. Now, the trying, you wouldn't think, well, how's that related to genocide? But actually, um, this in this case, you have this, this theme of justice taking place um, or uh, something like that. At any rate, um, but this is, there were other transits going on at the time, but there were also on November 24th, when they were coming into a trine, 300 plus worshipers killed by an extremist religious group at a mosque in Egypt. Uh, so there's another, you know, another example of the ethnic religious cleansing motif that becomes really strong and dominant. So religiosity can become sort of extreme. Uh, Similarly, um, or on a, on a similar um, note, um, on December 6th, the U.S. officially recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. We had a big declaration, Jupiter, about a holy city, Neptune, and a pilgrimage site, Jupiter-Neptune. 
Um, but the entire issue reflected the complications, again, of religious and ethnic warfare and the desire to absorb um, differences between Palestinians and is Israelis into singularity. So the other thing that Jupiter and Neptune can try to do is absorb and take in as much as possible to kind of merge things into one bigger whole. And that with the Jupiter and a Mars ruled sign, there may be some kind of forcefulness or militance that's involved with that. Um, for example, on December 14th, same trine between the two, Walt Disney there's a motion picture studio, film is Neptune, and uh, related to fantasy and imagination, Disney, Disney uh, films, absorbed, uh, Walt Disney as a company absorbed most of 21st Century Fox for $66 billion. So here you have the theme of film and imagination and expansion of business and absorption of two things becoming one. That's all very Jupiter, Neptune. Uh, now, um, you also had Russia being banned from the 2018 Winter Olympics for state-sponsored doping. So there you can see Jupiter as bigness, muscle, expansion, and Neptune as the drug, the chemical, the cheating, the deception, the lying. So those were all events that were happening the last time that these two um, got together. Well, what do we see happening in the news right now? We see more related to the move of the, um, the embassy to uh, Jerusalem. So that same theme is coming back about religious purification and trying to sort of, um, for, sort of in a sense, forcefully absorb differences into singularity. Um, so uh, you can look for Jupiter trine, uh, Neptune as an expansion or renewal of faith or wisdom or commitment to something bigger that you're absorbing yourself or surrendering yourself to. So the theme of surrender and absorption, karmic justice, um, you see making differences into singularities, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. You can think about Jupiter, Neptune, um, overestimating something, its reach or underestimating the cost involved with something that it very faithfully and charismatically wants to get on board with. You can see Jupiter, Neptune stimulating the imagination to grow or discover a new world. Uh, you can see the relation to uh, the grandeur as well as the numbness of oneness, which is kind of a way of saying um, oneness can sometimes be um, a way of uh, trying to avoid important differences, uh, trying to clean our hands of diversity. On the other hand, sometimes oneness is a way of collapsing irrelevant or um, petty differences. And how do you know the difference between one and the other? Uh, the spiritual or religious impulse, as well as the desire to visit alternative dimensions of consciousness. Um, you can think of uh, a, a bold new vision, a statement of faith or a vow, um, and uh, the mood of compassion and global outreach. These are all Jupiter-Neptune themes. But note that in water, again, uh, one of the uh, most personal ways that you'll feel this will be in terms of um, big, grand feelings and emotions, deep sentimentality, deep romantic longings, the, deep, the call to deepen, expand, or um, uh, grow your spiritual life, or your imaginative life, or your artistic life, or your love life. So these are the kinds of impulses that come through. Now, um, <clears throat> I want to read this uh, piece from the Bhagavad Gita, which is a really good sort of it's a good way to put all of this into perspective. Uh, <clears throat> because we, here's the, here's the thing that happens before I read this. We get filled with the impulse to expand and grow and go somewhere big with all of this. And as that impulse um, comes through, uh, oftentimes uh, filtering it through the untrained ego, the undisciplined uh, ego, um, going back to our, our Saturn uh, moon dynamic, um, we will feel these impulses. And in order to satisfy a, a true calling that we might be feeling from this influence, uh, all planetary transits, if felt from the uh, position of uh, soulful living, of uh, spiritual discipline, all transits can be felt as the call to deepen spiritual life. And the appropriate way to dovetail all influences with the cultivation of our spiritual life is part of our natural intelligence that we 
have and can bring out and use as a, a, a beautiful and easy navigation system, but we can't do it without cultivation. It doesn't happen unless we're uh, giving ourselves to a spiritual process, surrendering ourselves to a spiritual uh, lifestyle. I, I emphasize that more and more because sometimes the astrology world turns no, into nothing more than, um, you know, an elaborate fortune cookie that's uh, feeding into my existential anxiety and attachment to just worldly stuff that's never going to satisfy me. You know, so it becomes it becomes nothing more than um, uh, uh, a waste of time. Uh, now, on the other hand, when you have an influence like this that's so big and so prone to imaginative, romantic, um, emotional, and spiritual longing for something more, for something different, for something bigger, uh, to surrender to something, how easy it is to mistake that, those strong feelings for, well, I'll just get into another relationship. But maybe, the, you know, probably the relationship will follow the same patterns that you've struggled with in relationships your whole life. Or I'm going to, I'm now I'm going to, um, I'm going to invest some more money into a new stock. I think it's an exciting new prospect. Okay. Well, the stock will probably go up and down as stocks do. You know what I mean? Um, close my, my phone was vibrating or you may say, well, I'm going to indulge myself in a big purchase or I'm going to, you know, so there's all of these temptations that come along with this kind of transit and the, the temptations can go from those that look and appear, you know, uh, really shiny, but they're really just super material to things that are much trickier to navigate. Like, well, maybe a, a second higher degree, you know, maybe a third uh, trip to back to school, maybe uh, yet another very expensive spiritual workshop. You know, these kinds of things can also tempt us. Usually the, the, the difference between, the one thing you can always notice is that the real way of dovetailing our um, any of these impulses that we feel with spiritual life is um, uh, quite simply, um, does this deepen my ability day after day after day for the rest of my life to draw closer to the source that I come from? Does it, does, it, does it help me to come closer to that in love? Or is it something that's more rooted in my desire to be special or to have some kind of you know, pleasure that I absolutely can't take with me when I die? And I know that sounds extreme, but that's really what it boils down to. You can use that kind of discernment um, uh, in everyday life. Okay, so here's what the Bhagavad Gita says for us about this one. <clears throat> this comes from chapter 13 of the Gita. This is a translation that I really like by um, Ridayananda Das Goswami from the um, Bhakti tradition, Comprehensive Guide to Bhagavad Gita with Literal Translation. Um, he's a great uh, scholar of Sanskrit. I really like the way he interprets uh, the, the language. He says, one sees, who sees the Supreme Lord standing equally in all beings, unperishing as they perish. That's a beautiful statement. Think about that. One sees, who sees the Supreme Lord standing equally in all beings, unperishing as they perish. First of all, the, the Gita here is suggesting that we each have our own autonomy as spiritual beings, and yet what provides us with that sense of being an autonomous, free, eternal being has to do with our ability to see the divine in, in everything that's different from us. And that's what gives us some sense of being an autonomous being. In fact, seeing the Lord abiding equally everywhere, one does not harm self by self. Then one travels on the highest path. And then the last paragraph of the chapter, actions are being fully done by nature alone one sees who thus sees self as non-doer, when one perceives that all beings' distinct states stand in one and expand from that alone, one then advances to Brahman. Beginningless, modeless, this unchanging supreme soul does not decline. Though present in the body, he neither acts nor is tainted. Just as all pervading space due to its subtlety is not sullied, so the self that pervades the body is not sullied. Just as one sun illumines all this world, so the one in the field illumines the whole field, Bharata. They reach the Supreme who thus know with knowledge I the difference between field and field knower and the liberation of beings from nature. That's a really beautiful, um, really beautiful passage. Um, and it's, it's very important because 
what Krishna is describing in the Gita is that um, what gives us knowledge is the ability to slowly develop the um, the natural intelligence that allows us to see and feel changes in the field, right? And that's water, to, to see, to sense, to feel all of the changes happening around us. But the intelligence comes when rather than acting and reacting unconsciously to that, as though that's all that we are, is just a part of that web of, of material changes, that we see that within the heart of all beings that are a part of that web of fluctuating changes is the same unchanging eternal divine supreme that we're all made of as spirit souls. And we can't do that with a grand water trine or with Jupiter trine, Neptune or whatever, if when we are, are feeling and sensing the need for change or the impulse to do something spiritual with our lives or the romantic impulse or whatever, we're, we're feeling that powerful emotional dynamic of Jupiter and Neptune and all we do is react. So we have to have, so the whole purpose of studying astrology, which I say as often as I can, um, is, is so that we develop the intelligence to see the divine within the changes and not get lost in them. Because then we lose track of the unperishing and the perishing, the unchanging and the changing. So that's a little Bhagavad Gita lesson for today. Now, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about whether or not we should pay so much attention to all of this stuff about grand water trines and kites and Solomon's keys and yods and all of this stuff. Now, I'm going to say two things that are going to seem kind of contrary. One is I'm going to say that they're all nonsense. So I just want to start by, I, they're all nonsense. Let's just start by that and shock everyone and maybe even make some people <laughs> a little mad, <laughs> right? And then we're going to say something different, which is, and we can get a lot out of, we can get a lot out of them. So uh, let's start with number one. Why would I possibly say that a yacht or a kite or a Solomon's key, or I don't even know if there is such a thing. I think there's something called Solomon's or a bucket, or you know, whatever, all of these chart patterns, where do they come from? Well, um, let's just uh, be clear. They don't exist in the tradition until very recently. So for the history of, the, the vast history of astrology, um, uh, they're not used, and they, have, they, they don't have to be used as though they are all important and have always been all important. So when I say they're nonsense, all I'm trying to do is shake loose the modern uh, tendency to get fixated on speculative, complicated ways of looking at astrology. What I mean by speculative and complicated is that the more that we use astrology with an eye for complexity, uh, the more that we tend, as people who tend to be mentally undisciplined, meaning we, most people don't have practices of mindfulness or meditation that are very regular, that that are steady, that teach you how to keep your mind from losing itself in complications and subtleties and, uh, and overstimulation, right? We live in a world where it's like every day, oh, we're just inundated by tons of stuff, streaming stuff on CNN, uh, you, me showing up in your news feed, <laughs> like what, whatever, you're just, we're, we're inundated with like way too much stuff. And so because most of us also lack um, grounded everyday practices to learn how to steady the mind and body, to return to the heart, to keep in touch with our eternal source, because that's not in our lives, one of our greatest en enemies is complexity and overstimulation. Now, I'm not suggesting, complexity is not the same as diversity. Uh, by complexity, what I mean are too many factors to have to analyze and make sense of. And that does not mean stupidity either, right? Just too many things to have to keep track of, to understand, to make sense of, to synthesize. And I see students of astrology struggling with this mightily because when you enter into the, uh, you know, it's like the, modern astrology is like the bar in Star Wars. You know, you, you walk in and there's just crazy creatures everywhere and there's crazy music going on. Han Solo's blowing away an alien over there. I mean, it's just a, it's a total nutso scene because you're looking at a very unique moment in the history of astrology with lots of opportunities and options and interesting innovations. But also, um, in some ways, uh, it's, it's a lot of mavericks and not a ton of respect for tradition. That's just a general truth that I observe. And part of that is because 
really the ancient lineages of astrology are not nearly as cohesive in the West as they are in the East, for, for one thing. And also because in the West, we, um, we value individualism and experimentation and revolution and change and stuff like that. And we also haven't had a lot of the ancient texts available to us until recently. And even then, we're trying to reconstruct a, a doctrines and teachings that have not been practiced for a long time. So it's, it's happening imperfectly. And so it's kind of like that when you walk into it. It's filled with complexity. So within that complexity, a lot of the innovations of modern astrology, <clears throat> I generally have very little tolerance for anymore. Because in my own studying and training, I got to a point where I recognized that I was looking for signal rather than static. And it just didn't help me to be throwing in so many factors, a million asteroids, a million minor aspects. And I know I'm sounding really, really grumpy. And I don't, I, I promise I'll, I'll redeem myself here in a moment. A million asteroids, a million minor aspects, a million chart patterns, a million house systems, uh, you know, four different versions of evolutionary astrology, you know, like, like all of the stuff you could do. And then you're supposed to make sense out of it all somehow. And mostly what people do to make sense out of it all is um, they come up with their new own brand. Well, I'm just taking from here and here and here and kind of making sense of it on my own. Can you blame anybody? How else would you do it? There's not, unless you find a teacher you really, really resonate with, hopefully, and some people do, um, then you're kind of on your own. So you have to figure it out like that. Uh, and, the, and one of the, uh, the, the, attractive, the attractiveness of the grand pattern in the chart for the ego is that if you have a, oh, I've got a grand trine in my chart, or I've got a grand square, or I have a, I have a complicated yacht, I've got three yachts, oh, my yacht is getting activated by this outer planet, well, I'm also getting a T-square from this, and I'm getting flanked by that, and all of this. It makes us feel more important than we are. And I, I know that's like, that's the dirty secret that nobody wants to say, but nobody is that important. None of us in the great cosmic scheme, we're all divine, equal on the spiritual level, we're all divine, equal souls. So, but yet we live our our day to day lives like all of this, all of these patterns, and all of this stuff in the chart is somehow makes me, me special or important, or it makes what I'm going through right now just a little bit more crazy and dynamic, right? And the the truth is, the simple truth is that you can use ten less symbols and say. Uh, and and say a little bit more concisely some very accurate and beautiful things that also describe what you're going through right now. So that's the first thing that I want to say is, uh, generally speaking, I don't really care about grand trines and yods and all of these things because I see them as interesting and beautiful modern innovations, but things that generally unneed, unneed, or sort of needlessly complexify things. So we could argue about that all day long, right? So that's, you know, people are going to disagree with me and that's, obviously that's fine. So now I want to be a little redeeming and say, and they're beautiful and interesting. So um, on the other hand, I find that um, anything in astrology, any symbol can be useful and artful. And I know um, one of my favorite astrologers, for example, Rick Levine, um, uses minor aspects just wonderfully. And I have a, a, a former student, student uh, his name's Stuart Krimko, and he uh, uses asteroids just beautifully. Uh, just recently hosted Henry Seltzer, owner of Astrograph. He gave a talk on newly discovered planets that was super intelligent and interesting. So I think of these, all of these different things also as like I would in uh, the yoga world, right? In, in yoga asana, in the studios, Sometimes people, they become really good at handstands or inversions. And so they teach a workshop on those things. They specialize in those things. Someone else becomes really good at, uh, you know, pregnancy, uh, pregnancy yoga, you know, yoga for, for pregnant women. Um, and so specializing or becoming focused or being called to the particular use of specific symbols. Maybe you become someone who's really interested in the grand trine or the yacht or whatever. So it's not at all to say that... Um, they have no utility, that they, that they don't work, that they're not real, um, and that there aren't wonderful astrologers doing really good things with them. So I, I, say, it, I, say, I say it on both sides. I say on one sense, I see, I see them as frivolous, needlessly complicated, and indicating a, a tendency for people to get uh, their egos lost in uh, you know, the complications and sort of uh, 
uh, amplifications of their dramas, which really aren't the point of life. And that's just my opinion. Um, and then on the other hand, I think you have wonderful, sensitive, intelligent astrologers using them uh, in ways that are uh, good. So uh, that's what I want to say about that. Because I get people asking me all the time, emailing me, what do you think of yods? What do you think of kites? What do you think of this and that? grand water trines, etc. Well, I wouldn't spend the time to talk about a grand water trine today if I didn't think it was a legitimate thing. I also need to say that it's nonsense so that we remember that in a sense, I know this is also going to sound really audacious, but in a sense, all astrology is nonsense, right? <laughs> like, because um, astrology is a symbolic language. And so, um, you know, again, it's like, pick your tools, P pick your pick your set of tools and just use them intelligently to help describe the, the karmic circumstances of life that we're experiencing and the the uh, relationship that we can have with the life that the the destiny that we're living. If astrology is in service to that, then in a sense, it doesn't matter which tools you use. That's my feeling. So that's why I wanted to say about that. All right. So last but not least, um, going up here, uh, we have. Uh, Mars just finishing its first square, its first square to Uranus. So Uranus has just changed signs into Taurus. We've got that uh, really dynamic level of change happening with uh, Uranus entering Taurus, a, a whole new area of life. I've talked about that extensively already in several earlier video blogs. You can check them out uh, to hear more on that. But when Mars squares Uranus, I'm going to read one more section from uh, my buddy Ren Butler's new book, The Archetypal Universe, which I'm trying to help promote. Uh, for him. And um, we're going to read just briefly again the Mars Uranus influence uh, from his uh, text. There's this wonderful passage that he has exploring this one. Mars Uranus, you should be feeling this one in the sky right now. Dynamic urges toward freedom and independence, determined cravings for thrills and excitement, sudden breakthroughs and rushes of energy, electric yang enthusiasm. Tendencies toward excessive self-will, reckless courage and defiance, impulsive rash actions, flashes of anger. So you got that energy in this kind of in the sky right now. Be careful. You know, you it may be time to make some forceful, brave changes. It could also be a time to put your foot in your mouth and follow the impulse to defy or resist or, um, you know, uh, challenge something or, or someone unnecessarily. So you have to be careful. You know, we might want to poke people's buttons right now. It's easy to want to do that with this one. You can also be overly sensitive to people pushing your own buttons. Um, now, today, for example, when I just gave that whole, you know, uh, grand trines are nonsense. Oh, but no, they aren't. That's Mars Uranus. That's totally Mars Uranus. In fact, I have Mars just entering my 10th house, my career place, squaring Uranus now in my first house. So very simply, it was like when I thought of doing that today, I was like, Oh, that would be fun. That'd be, that'd be a fun way of just stirring the pot a little bit. But now you know. So if you're really annoyed by me, right, you can be like, well, Adam's embodying a little Mars Uranus. There you go. <laughs> and you can, for, you can forgive me because the moon's in Cancer. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. Uh, now, um, we're also going to see the only other thing I think I'm... Tomorrow we'll have the moon opposite uh, Pluto, early on, late in the, it's basically the middle of the night. You'll feel that influence though late tonight and early tomorrow. The, um, the moon Pluto is uh, very cathartic and often results in, in kind of emotional breakthroughs or breakdowns or breakdown to breakthrough. Um, and, uh, you know, also pur purgation and uh, a feeling of needing to cleanse or clean something or confront something that's emotional and deep and somewhat difficult. Now that's kind of coming through later with the moon Pluto. It's very brief transit, but it's a little window where you might be feeling that. Um, and then on May, uh, let's see, tomorrow, um, Venus enter enters uh, Cancer. So Venus entering Cancer, uh, leaving Gemini, the social mood of Venus, which is a social planet that is a planet of friendship and uh, socializing um, and love and romance too, uh, Venus entering Cancer, the mood shifts from very chatty and Gemini and, and mercurial in a sense, very airy, um, into watery. So it's a much more sensitive, domestic, private, sweet, nurturing, 
uh, Venus that's coming through. So you might start to feel that shift in your relationships. Be careful, you know, that you don't, um, with Venus is going to start opposing Saturn right away as of tomorrow, which means, you know, your level of sensitivity and need in your relationships and the tendency to get a Saturnine response, a strict, hard, cold, grow up, take care of your own needs, etc. Like that's building right now. So just be aware of that dynamic. If you start realizing, oh, I need something, and my partner is so hard or cold, be careful because maybe they're not so hard and cold. Maybe you're projecting a little bit of Saturn, that Saturn opposition onto them. On the other hand, um, sometimes the Saturn-Venus dynamic will expose some level at which you're being insensitive or your needs aren't being addressed and you really do need to do something about it. Um, just remember the tendency of this transit to amplify these archetypal dynamics and then remember what we read in the Gita today. <laughs> All of those dynamics, they're just constantly changing and moving and flowing just like rivers and mountains go up and crumble and stars are born and stars die. Those kinds of dynamics. Oh, I really need this. Oh, you're cold and hard. Oh, it's not, you know, all of that stuff, just nature, just moving. So it's not like you have to pretend as though, you know, you're some cold, renounced, uh, well, I just hate life or it's all just an illusion or something like that. But knowing this, again, you don't have to get lost in it. You don't have to uh, overreact to what's happening. And in fact, you can use it as an opportunity to deepen your spiritual life. Um, your natural intelligence will kick in and tell you what to do with this influence that would actually be constructive and advance your spiritual life. You just have to, all you have to do is think about it a little bit. Journaling helps and any kind of daily practice that you can uh, do coupled with enough water and good sleep. <laughs> Those are some primary ingredients. All right. Um, so then uh, that's, yep, that makes it through everything that I wanted to say today. You'll have, uh, I get one thing that we could look at very briefly would be on Monday, the sun will enter Gemini, but I'll be talking about that probably on Monday. So that's another thing coming. Any questions? What exactly, um, uh, what exactly makes it defined as grand versus a regular trine? A regular trine would mean one side of the, the triangle in the chart. There are 120 degree angles that are made between same, signs of the same element, fire to fire to fire, earth to earth to earth, etc. And so when you have um, like Jupiter and Neptune connecting from Scorpio to Pisces, that's a regular trine. When you get all, when you get three planets in all three water signs connected closely in the degree-based trines, that's called a grand water trine. Um, yeah, it's just a it's just a word for a dynamic that you can see in the sky that you know does repeat itself. Linda, I have a friend Pisces who lives by if I can't feel it, it's not real. That that sounds like a Piscean statement, of course. The um, the downside to that, of course, would be that, um, uh, you know, most spiritual traditions also uh, tell us that um, it's, it's very possible to uh, uh, get lost in our emotional life and emotional responses and needs and things like that. All water signs have to be a little careful of that, too. Let's enrich and celebrate our emotional intelligence. Yes, that sounds like a good plan. Uh, okay. I'm watching from Bhutan. Oh, cool. Glad you're here. In the workplace, there is a greater focus arising on emotional labor with folks in the caring professions. Sure. Um, often people don't realize that the number of hours that you work uh, or the description of the tasks that you do is not the same as the, um, as the load that you carry on other levels, like, like your emotional level or your, uh, physiological level, your stress load, the, the, your heart rate, you know, your, your blood pressure. We don't, we don't measure those things. And maybe one of the reasons we don't is because we are not thinking of business in terms of water. We're thinking of it maybe in terms of some other elements and excluding water. I don't know. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your questions. And I hope you guys all have a very beautiful day. Take care. Bye.